You're listening to the Plastic Shift Podcast. Welcome to the Plastic Shift Podcast. I'm Madhav Malhotra, one of the students at the Plastic Shift, and I'm reaching out to several experts working to solve issues with plastic pollution. And today, I'm joined by Dr. Lise Magnier, Assistant Professor of Consumer Research at the Delft University of Technology. Her research focuses on how consumers respond to sustainable products and packaging. Since plastic packaging is a major aspect of plastic pollution, I'm really looking forward to learning how her work can be applied to this major problem. I just wanted to start off by thanking you for joining me today. I'm really excited to hear a little bit more about your work, but I first of all just wanted to ask you to give a quick introduction to yourself and the experiences you've had and the interests you have in your research work. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here today. I'm uh, Assistant Professor of Sustainable Consumer Behavior at the TU Delft so the, in the Netherlands. And uh, in my research, I look at how consumers respond to packaging and more uh, specifically to more sustainable packaging. And it's really interesting to hear about that work because plastic packaging is a very big part of plastic waste as a whole. But in general, it's really interesting to see how your research in product sustainability as a whole could be applied to this problem. So when it comes to products and sustainability, what role does the packaging that a company chooses to use have on the overall sustainability of a product? What are their choices or options there? So packaging in general, it's often called the silent seller. So it, it has, it's quite fascinating actually the, the huge influence it can have on consumers' perceptions about a product and on choice as well. When it comes to sustainability in packaging, what uh, I found is my research is that indeed when the packaging is visibly more sustainable, it kind of increases the perceived naturalness of the products and and through that also the perceived quality so visibly sustainable material in general they are more biomaterials like craft paper fiber based materials this kind of more organic materials they really really have a strong effect on perceived naturalness so yeah indeed the material choice is is uh, is of yeah huge importance there so f from a consumer point of view plastic does not have a very good reputation actually it's it's often not preferred as a material that's that's what we see in all the tests we we make but it's often bought as default let's say people want to buy a product and it comes with a packaging and yeah most of the time people are not going to not buy a product because they don't like the material of the package. And next to that, it's also, it has a lot of advantages, this, this material. It's very practical and it protects the products very well. So that's also yeah, one of the positive things about plastics. Mm -hmm. You were talking a lot about material choice. And mm -hmm. in the, I guess, just to lay the groundwork for this discussion, when it comes to overall product um, sustainability, you're saying that one of the first things people notice, consumers, about a product is whether the packaging is visibly sustainable. So the packaging yeah. is a big influence on that. And then you're also saying that a big component of whether a consumer judges products packaging to be sustainable is based mm -hmm. on the type of material that is used. Yes, indeed. Okay. Are there any other major influences that we should keep in mind or is that the... Yeah, maybe something to note and that is very important is that there is often quite a big difference between consumers' perceived sustainability of a material and real sustainability of alternatives, which means that often consumers perceive a material as being yeah, more sustainable than another and it, it's it doesn't mean that it is. As you know, sustainability is a complex topic. And even for experts, it's, it's difficult to evaluate what is more sustainable in the sense that yeah, if you look at life cycle assessments, 
sometimes you have some uh, counterintuitive results when you look at materials. And sustainability, it's, it can be uh, indeed pollution, but it can be uh, CO2 emissions, it can be also the effects of a material on health, for example. And if you look at plastics, all these three aspects can have an influence on how you perceive it to be sustainable. So if, if you say, yeah, often, for example, glass is uh, considered to be quite sustainable by, by consumers because it's a novel material and it's, it's, it's easy to recycle and the, the raw material it's sand, so it's easy to find. It, it's just not like petrol or something. Only if you look at glass, it actually costs quite a lot of energy to melt sand into glass. And it's the same amount of energy you need when you recycle glass. So it's, it's not from, let's say, a, an environmental uh, or CO2 emissions uh, perspective. It's, it's not the best alternative, actually. And it's also quite heavy. So when you transport it, it also uses more gas than plastics, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important point. Oftentimes, people fail to realize this when it comes to policies, especially where we see um, sometimes examples like forcing companies to use a particular type of packaging. For instance, I believe in India right now, many single-use plastics are being banned. But in some cases, the alternatives that they're being replaced with aren't always the most sustainable when you look at the data, but perhaps they might be perceived as sustainable, as you mentioned. Indeed, but like I said, it's a very complex issue because if you look at CO2 emissions, indeed plastics is, uh, is often actually the best option over even, yeah, if you think cotton bags and uh, f flax uh, uh, fiber bags because you really need to use them hundreds of times before they are more sustainable, let's say, than, than a plastic bag. But if you look at, for example, things that can be problematic, so, such as health issues in terms of endocrine disruptors, we don't know yet what, what's the real effect of plastics. And actually there are studies that say that we do eat kind of the equivalent of a credit card of plastic every week. So the pollution that plastics creates through going into the environment, into our water, into fish, into even the air, it's also very problematic. So indeed, if you say, yeah, single-use plastic is maybe more sustainable in terms of CO2 emission than other materials, that's true. And that's, of course, a very, very important issue. But if you look at pollution and the effect that plastics has on biodiversity and also on health, that's, that's another very important issue. So yeah, it's difficult to, to evaluate really mm -hmm. what's the best Yes, it's very complicated. And you talked about all of the different examples with uh, the different materials and also how the issue is it has a different significance for, say, the people studying it versus the people trying to make policies based on this data with, lim with limitations on it versus consumers themselves. To add to the complexity here for a second, I also wanted to ask you about the role of business here. Because when it comes to, say, the business, you were talking earlier about how sometimes the sustainability versus the perceived sustainability can be different. But for the business, what are the incentives that they have when it comes to monitoring whether a product is actually sustainable? Because when I initially think about it, it seems that if a product might be seen as sustainable by consumers, well, that might help increase sales, but then they also have to think about, well, does a material have more costs? Could you mm. talk about the complexity of making that decision and the different factors involved? Yeah, so I think for companies, they're at the point now where they have made the 
the changes for the easy wins, meaning that they avoided waste and made their packaging more sustainable, but now the public is really asking for more. And if you see if all the surveys and uh, with consumers, I think 90% of people say that they find it important to have products packaged in a sustainable packaging. But indeed, it can come with higher costs, especially at the moment, if you look at the price of petrol, it's very low. So it's actually way more beneficial from an economic perspective to have virgin plastic rather than uh, recycled plastics. So it's also, yeah, like you see, very complex because indeed people say that they really want more sustainable packaging. But you see also that they continue to buy a lot of products that are not sold in a sustainable packaging per se. So that's what we call in consumer behavior, the attitude behavior gap, meaning that they have an attitude, but often, especially in sustainability, it's very relevant. The final behavior doesn't completely, uh, is not completely in accordance to, to the attitude. That's complex as well, but Seeing how things are evolving, I think now companies really have, it's, it's not a question anymore whether they should do it. It's really a question from a, a strategical point of view. If, if they don't take that uh, step now, it, it's going to be too late to take it later. All the, the policies and laws are going in this direction. I, I don't think there is a choice anymore for companies. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting to hear because from the outside, you know, not having looked into the industry, some, some might wonder how much do companies actually value seeing whatever the increase in sales might be versus like the cost of increases in materials. But it's really yeah. interesting to hear you talk about the external pressures being put on companies now that kind of force the choice onto them that they do have to switch to something. But the yeah. question now is, are they going to switch to something that is actually sustainable or is it just an effort to placate the demands out there? Yeah, well, it's, it's indeed a question is not whether or not they should take that step, but more how. In, at least in Europe, there are yeah, some European directives which kind of will force companies to... Um, use recycled materials, for example, in their packaging. So by 2025, I think companies should use 50% of plas recycled plastics in their packaging. And it goes up, like, I think it's 55% in 2030 and so on and so forth. In the Netherlands, the plan is to be fully cir circular by 2050 with some milestones in between, but that's the goal at least. In, in any case, using recycled materials will be better than, than just using virgin petrol-based uh, materials, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it will be interesting to see how those changes play out in the long run. But for now, there's a lot of complexity involved in the transition. So I wanted to mm -hmm. ask you about the solutions currently being implemented to, say, help companies make this transition to decide you know what is the best way to go about making our products more sustainable what are the costs involved here what are the changes that we're going to make in our operations and make that transition more seamless or help companies to embrace this change yeah so i i'm not the expert really in that i i know a few things i know that there are european directives i know that in every country like I'm I'm from the Nether well in the Netherlands, so I know there are uh, institutions that really help companies taking steps, looking at life cycle assessments of of, uh, of materials, for example, and looking at what are the best uh, solutions for them. Also at consumer perceptions, because it's also very important. Of course, you want to to be perceived as at least as well as they used to be and even better there are also some uh, laws and i think in europe there is for example this packaging and waste packaging di directive that's really important but some countries 
even go beyond and they are really uh, introducing more let's say aggressive even targets with uh, fees for introducing non-recyclable packaging setting a higher recycling targets like i said earlier also having more recycled materials in the plastic packaging some single use plastics are banned as well especially for the products that are most often found in the oceans so there are organizations within the countries that can help companies but there are also policies and laws that are really forcing the change mm -hmm. and from your perspective yeah as someone who studies the reactions that consumers have based on these changes, as you mentioned, this is something that is obviously important to companies. They want to know how their products will be influenced by making these changes. So do you find that the work you do and the research that is being put out on this topic, is it mm -hmm. something that um, companies often use to make their decisions? Is there a gap in the research being done and the companies accessing it? I think they use it because I'm often contacted by companies who want to know more about some perceptions of materials or, or even if the product really match a type, matches a type of packaging and so on and so forth. So it has an impact, but I think there is still a lot of research missing. So there is actually not so much research into consumers' perceptions of yeah, even recycled products, or we know something about contamination, so that some consumers really have some like perceived the products are being contaminated when they are uh, recycled, for example. Or so we know some things, but we we are far from understanding really everything from a consumer perspective. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to think about what that might mean for future research. There are lots of nonprofits being started and a bunch of educational initiatives being launched out there that try to teach people more about the overall impact that their choices have. Not like from a technical, this is the life cycle analysis perspective, but at least a bit more about, well, even if you do buy, say, a reusable bag, well, you have to reuse it this many times before you actually make an impact. It's interesting yeah. to consider how, as people become more educated on that, maybe your research would have to be extended to not just how do consumers initially react to the product, but what are their other concerns as to how they're going to use the product over time that influences mm -hmm. their perceived sustainability. Yeah, that's true. And it's also a complex issues, issue that we have looked at. And I think in that domain, there are new initiatives that I find interesting, if not exciting, that are being developed in terms of, for example, you were mentioning reusable bags, but in terms of reusable packaging, because so far there, it's of course not a new concept. It's been around forever and it's even maybe the, the, the oldest type of packaging, but it's never been really user-centered. And I think this user centeredness is really crucial in the sense that people have busy lives and it, it's, it's really something on the top that it's sometimes, for example, bringing your bag along. It's not that people don't care and don't want to buy, bring their bag along. It's just that they sometimes just don't have it at the right moment creating solutions that are more user centered and that enable people to actually reuse because yeah oftentimes it's not that people don't want to do it it's just that it's it's the situation that is like that will in my opinion will have a good effect on the, on how people reuse for example mm -hmm, definitely and i think that is a relevant thing for the last question that i had for you which mm -hmm. was around these ideas of what are going to be the areas of development when it comes to, say, research in consumer behavior or just how consumers use these products in general that you're most excited to see in the next five years? And which areas you thought when it comes to research or these other solutions that need more attention still? Well, of course, I'm, I'm doing research in, in recycling and 
and in uh, also perceptions of more bio-based materials and this kind of stuff. But what I'm really quite excited about is just what I was talking about just before is about the implementation of reusable solutions for packaging. So you really see that now there are actually few initiatives, at least uh, I see in Europe, but I think in North America as well, that are really taking this direction of offering services that are really user-centered. So for, for groceries, for example, front of the door delivery of refillable packages, and the company also take care of picking up the packages, cleaning and refilling them. Most of the time, it was something that was still the work of the consumer. And taking that away from the consumer, I think, can really help in developing this yeah, reusable packaging. But like you said before, often it's more novel materials or more. So they really need to be reused many times before they are actually more sustainable than a single use packaging in terms of CO2 emissions, for example. But you know that if you use a tin box 50 times, it's not gonna be very, yeah, it's not gonna be perfect anymore. And what will people think about receiving ice cream or biscuits in a, in a box that is scratched and yeah, that has visible signs of wear and tear. I think there is a lot of research in to be done into how you can really counteract these negative effects, what kind of materials should be preferred, materials that of course age gracefully, for example. But yeah, I think there is really a lot to be done in this uh, in this domain. So that I'm quite excited about. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, it's very exciting to see how, you know, every few years there are these new developments in the research world that get a lot of people excited and it's really interesting to see how those developments in the research in academia are then taken mm -hmm. over into real solutions. For instance, recently in North America, we're seeing more services with the solutions that you mentioned where companies take care of reusability, for instance, with restaurants mm -hmm. giving out containers that they take back and clean. So it's really interesting to see how in the next few years, we're going to start to see these new research developments and how hopefully they'll lead to more innovative solutions in this space. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And then the last thing that I wanted to ask was, you know, it's very interesting to have had this discussion. And I know we talked about a bunch of the details in the different areas, but there are a lot of details that we didn't get to. So if someone <laughs> was uh, interested to learn more about your work, where might they go? I'm from the, the, the TU Delft, so they can uh, always contact me, of course, and uh, my publication are available online. So that's also a way to find out about my work. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think that'll be great for anyone hoping to hear more details. But for now, I really wanted to thank you for all of the insights you provided with these different areas of this very much emerging field. And I will be really excited to see the developments in this field and also with your work going forward in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me, madame. It was uh, also a pleasure talking to you today. <laughs>